Hello and welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session is an open discussion on visual astronomy versus astrophotography. Uh, or maybe I should say visual astronomy compared and contrasted to astrophotography. Because we're not going to argue over which one is better. Because most of us here agree. Well, most of us here agree that uh, astrophotography is better. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, we have people, well, we, we have a, a, a lot of people who are into astrophotography and Maybe just a slight fewer number of people in here that are uh, into visual astronomy. That's what we're going to be discussing tonight. That said, uh, before I go into that, I do want to show off our image of the week. And uh, one, uh, uh, this has happened again. Uh, I'm sorry. It, that must be ignore, uh, annoying. Ignore that screen for a second. And please also ignore it if you hear my voice echoing. There we go. Let's go. Let's... Yep. Okay. Uh, this week's image of the week is Thor's helmet by I do not know the uh, photographer of this one uh, because, uh, as has happened a few times in the past, they put under name the object's uh, name and then they put under. Uh, uh, title, I believe it was, uh, the, the object's name. So uh, if this is your image, please uh, let me know and I will get your name in there so that you get recognized for it. But just because you forgot to put your name in there doesn't mean that it is any less of a nice image and that's why I picked it. Um, just uh, really uh, great job here. Uh, Thor's helmet, so uh, a little bit for us... Uh, in the higher uh, uh, latitudes, a uh, little bit low on the horizon for us. So it's not one that I've ever got to image myself, but it's one that I really would like to uh, image. So don't, uh, please don't just look at it here in the video uh, because the resolution's crappy. Go to our website, check them out, check out all of our images of the week, comment on them, um, and enjoy or submit your own just by hovering over that and clicking image of the week submission, and it brings you to the page where you can submit them and check out other submissions. Um, okay, I think that's that on the image of the week. I'm going to steal my screen back, and I do know that before we start off, Alex wanted to mention a uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a processing workshop that's coming up. Alex, are you there? <clears throat> Alex is muted. I don't know if he knows. There you go. But you are muted, Alex. Don't know if I cannot unmute you there. Unmute. Now you're and, not muted. Okay, now I'm not muted. Am I still screen sharing? No, I'm not screen sharing anymore. Oh, screen share. There we go. That's me. Hi, everybody. Screen share. Share. Whew, that was a lot of work. And now I probably lost my, there, there, that's what I wanted to show you. Um, as you know, Warren Keller is uh, kind of a, a yeah, oops, I forgot to cancel my emails there. So if you see any secret emails popping up, don't ignore them. Um, Warren Keller uh, is a friend of all Astro Imagers. He um, and uh, his, his partner, Peter, and Ron Beckler, or Bechler, are putting out a, um, a, um, workshop coming up May 4th through the 6th and there's a lot of good information you can get on his website www.ip4ap.com workshops and you I'm sure you can find it from there um, and uh, he's got it's got it all set up and all that stuff it's 595 bucks which is a considerable amount of money but it's not nearly what you're paying for uh, when some of the other people do it from uh, Pix Insight themselves. And as we know, um, these guys are some pretty good presenters. I've seen them uh, both at uh, several different events, NEAC and at um, the Advanced Imaging Conference. It's three days, six hours each day, and um, it's got some beginner stuff in it, uh, as well as advanced track going on. Um, and there's an interesting barbecue coming up at Pete's home and observatory uh, coming up during that day. So there's lots of things to do. Uh, you can register by going to the website, again, uh, ip4ap.com and following the links there. 
I know he's got a strong registration so far, but he still has some room and you might as well get in while it's, you're still available. Um, just as a side comment, um, um, I know that RTMC, um, Brian Cog Cogdell uh, will be coming to do some presentations. So anybody who wants to get in on RTMCs, I'm not sure that the registration page is all set up yet, but um, that's an early notice on that. And for those of you who are on the mailing list that I've got, I'll be sending out some more information about all this in the next few days. But anyway, uh, if you're interested, particularly if you're back on the East Coast and you want to head up to Buffalo in springtime, which is real pretty, uh, you might want to go to the workshop with uh, uh, Warren Keller and Ron Beckler and uh, Peter Pru at, um, uh, and catch what's going on up there. Okay, thanks, Adam. Thank you, Alex. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I told you what I, uh, well, let me, let me take a step back. Uh, the past few weeks we've had open discussions, but kind of focused open discussions. The intent is uh, our open discussions aren't quite searchable and they are all over the place. Might not make great follow-up videos or if you're searching partic for particular information, it might not be the best way to find it. So by having an open discussion with a slightly focused topic, it gives us a little bit more uh, of a searchable uh, idea. So who's going to search for visual astronomy versus astrophotography? Well, my thought is that someone who's probably starting up uh, in visual astronomy or is, or is maybe even just looking at a telescope um, is going to start doing some research. And that seems to be one of the first questions you get uh, when you are looking for a telescope, whether you're calling up your uh, telescope store, or whether you're emailing someone, or whether you're on a forum. Um, hey, I'm thinking about buying, buying a telescope. Uh, one of those first questions they ask is, well, are you interested in astro astrophotography? And uh, frequently the answer is, well, I don't know. Um, why would I be? Should I be? Uh, so what's the difference between visual astronomy and astrophotography? Uh, I'm going to try and keep my portion of this quick and uh, let some of the other people in the room comment on this. So I'm basically just going to kind of give you the background on it. Visual astronomy uh, is basically hooking an eyepiece up to your telescope and looking through it, uh, just like, I don't know, probably all of us envisioned astronomy being uh, before we learned about astrophotography. Uh, it is uh, just the stereotypical uh, astronomer looking through the eyepiece up at the stars. Well, that can be really fulfilling. Uh, personally, I love visual astronomy for uh, planets. The planets almost look 3D. Uh, in my opinion, planets look a bit better in uh, through the eyepiece than they do uh, through uh, uh, with a camera, uh, whether you're displaying it on your screen or, or wherever it may be. Uh, I don't know why. I, I think they just get that 3D look. Um, Deep sky astrophotography objects, on the other hand, are very, very dim. And you don't, the first time you look through an eyepiece, um, you may not be able to pick out exactly what it is you're looking at. When I have done outreach, um, I always joke about this, and maybe the more experienced people in the room will, will recognize this, but you show someone something, you have a line of people and you're letting them look through the eyepiece and, and you get that, and you say, do you see it? And they say, yeah, yeah, I see it. That's cool. And uh, you go to the next person. Oh, yeah, I see it. That's cool. And then you go to the next person. The next person says, oh, my goodness. Well, they saw it. The first two people didn't. Um, it's, not something you, it's not something you pick out. When, when people are buying telescopes, we always tell them, don't go by the image on the box because you're not going to see that. You're going to be disappointed if you're expecting that image. It may be a Hubble image, it may be an amateur astro, astro uh, photograph, but um, it doesn't represent what you see through the eyepiece. When you look through the eyepiece, you're basically trying to pick out uh, monochromatic uh, wisps, or uh, in the case of galaxies, wisps. In the case of nebula, maybe it looks like uh, just cotton up in outer space, just little contrast. And the longer you look, the more you train your eye, the better you get at recognize those little features. Um, 
in addition to that, uh, you may be chasing different types of objects that are more conducive to uh, visual uh, observing. Globular clusters or brighter galaxies. Nebula might be a little bit difficult except for a few of the brighter ones. That doesn't prevent people from trying and that doesn't prevent people from actually achieving uh, really difficult objects, uh, actually observing those really difficult objects. Uh, but it isn't something you can immediately go out, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with your telescope first night and pick out some of those difficult objects. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> that cold is still haunting me. Um, so maybe, I, and I see this comment coming up, so I do want to at least uh, point out one other thing that uh, is going to be somewhere in between the two. Um, there is electronically assisted observing. And uh, what I mean by that is you can use either a camera or uh, a night vision camera or something uh, that assists um, the visual observing so that you're going to be seeing it either on a screen or through some sort of... Um, see the picture amplified in some way. Uh, there are now eyepieces that do the same thing, but um, kind of a night, a night vision eyepiece. Uh, but typically with electronically assisted observing, you're going to be looking at it at a screen. Uh, the intent is to get a live view of that object. Uh, so just like what visual astronomers want to do, they want to get a live, real view of that object through an eyepiece. Electrically assisted astronomers uh, will uh, get a live view on a computer screen or through uh, some sort of amplified eyepiece. On the astrophotography side, we take long exposure images over long periods of time, possibly only looking at those images briefly to make sure that everything's right. Uh, then the next morning, we hook them up to our computer and we do a lot of processing on them and we make them pretty. Uh, so they are vastly different uh, ways to enjoy astronomy. And we've each found one to be more compelling than the other. Um, but uh, it's, it's good to know when getting into astronomy that you do have uh, a bunch of different potential ways to uh, to do it. Um, you know, astronomy doesn't stop at the eyepiece or the computer screen or uh, the picture. Um, a lot of the data that astronomers deal in just come out in uh, spreadsheets, right? And if you're analyzing a spreadsheet for light curves, uh, that's a form of astronomy. That, that's, that's a form of science that uh, will probably uh, be just as fulfilling as uh, whatever interest we have, whether it be astrophotography, observing, or the the really uh, I, I I say geeky, but not in a not in a bad way, or the really geeky sciencey stuff. Uh, so that's it. I'm going to try and be done talking, except to set up a few questions. We have an expert, uh, or, or uh, Alex. I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to call you an expert observer unless you think that's appropriate, which it may be. Um, but you know us. No, as, it's not appropriate. Yeah, you know us astronomers. <laughs> okay, uh, what, what, no, I, think, I think you're chasing me about the astronomical league thing. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to let uh, Adam uh, go through the comments and everything and, and review what's happening over on the what you call while I talk for a minute here. Um, I've been a uh, visual astronomer for about 20 years, I guess. And I've also been an amateur telescope maker, so I've made some scopes and, and stuff like that. Um, I actually get as much or more satisfaction out of visual astronomy. I'm going to concede right off the bat that the images that I take um, show me more of the deep space objects. They're in color. They can be manipulated in various ways to produce certain uh, impressions. And uh, if I were just trying to uh, see images 
I would say that the stuff that I see with photography is a better picture. However, the whole visual experience, uh, it's hard to beat it as far as I'm concerned. And by the whole visual experience, I mean uh, getting a good old fashioned telescope out there, chasing down the object, finding it when you don't know where it is, having to use whatever maps and everything else you've got, and um, locating the object, distinguishing it from other possible objects that, that could be there. If there are, you know, if, if you're looking for a, ga a galaxy and there, you, you got to figure out if there are other galaxies in the area, you got the right one. And then seeing just how much detail you can get out of it is for me a much more rewarding experience than uh, telling a computer to go do its work and all that other stuff. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm proud of the pictures I make. Uh, they're not as good as a lot of other people's pictures, but they're pretty good pictures. But um, the, the fact that I've, I've found and studied and enjoyed a lot of objects, um, and deep space objects and various other things, yeah, that's, that's cool. I like the idea that this light is coming right to my eyeballs and not being interfered with by electronics or visual displays or anything else like that. I like the fact that I'm out there in the cold or sometimes out in my t-shirt when it's warm <laughs> or whatever it is, but I'm out there, um, you know, with nature and everything else. Uh, what, uh, we, what I started this part of the conversation with was about the uh, uh, master astronomer. I was teasing the folks before the show that I'm going to be the only one here advocating a place for visual astronomy. And except for the two ladies, Pam and who was it, Linda? Way back there at the top. Yeah, Linda and Pam said uh, they're into visual astronomy too. Well, um, you can see that we're kind of outnumbered, you know, or as Eric says, what's an eyepiece? Um, but the, uh, I'm, I'm a firm advocate in disciplined observing visually. And that means for me, finding out what I'm going to go look for, challenging myself to, to actually look for certain things, not just push the scope around and see what's up tonight. And as a result, I have completed a number of the Astronomical League observing programs. And when you get a sufficient number of those, I call them merit badges, um, when you've completed a number of those lists, you get a little button and I've completed enough of those to be considered a master observer. Now that's not magical. There are lots of ma master observers out there. And I really can't remember nearly as much as I have seen and written and sketched out. Uh, I can't remember all that stuff. So if you ask me some observing questions, I can help you observe and stuff like that. Uh, but don't ask me what I think of NGC 2732 or where it is or stuff like that. I can probably find by memory probably about, um, oh, maybe 20, 25 Messier objects. But you get much past that, I can't do it. Okay? So, um, they were teasing me before the sh before we got we went live about that I'd be probably the only person advocating for visual astronomy. What I tend to do is uh, I've got an observatory, and right near my observatory, I've got a um, there's a number of pads all out at Goat Mountain, um, the observing club or the my Riverside Astronomical Society has an observing site out in the desert, and I've got an observatory, and they've got. 23, I think, observatories and 32 concrete pads with electricity and all that other stuff. So in a typical day, I'll go out and, um, you know, get my observatory ready to run for the imaging and set up Sequence Generator Pro to gather the data. I will set up a 15-inch daub that my friend gave me, and I will um, set up a couple of tables with uh, observing charts and stuff like that. I'll go in and presuming that the gods are on my side today, I will start the um, imaging run, SGP will take over, and I'll go out and start uh, my visual observing. And uh, after 10, 15 minutes, after the first set of exposures come in, I'll go in and check to see 
uh, how the, ex the, the observatory is running. Um, and then it'll, if it's running fine, I'll go back out and continue observing. And uh, that's what I do. So um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Adam and, and let him continue this group conversation. Thanks, Alex. Um, let me uh, pop that over. Um, yeah, and it's interesting. You mentioned, uh, before I pass it uh, around to someone who I know is a little bit more uh, astro uh, imaging oriented, um, the equipment is a little bit more interesting. Uh, with visual observing, I think um, a Dobsonian is probably uh, almost a necessity, right? Uh, you don't have to have a job. But uh, I don't think you could be a, uh, a uh, uh, what do I want to say, a seasoned visual observer without a system like a DOB where you really have a lot of aperture, right? So you can pick up those really dim objects. Um, with, we, we always say with telescopes, bigger is always better. Uh, but with astrophotography, bigger is always better right up until the mount can't hold it. And you'll find that the mounts will hit their capacity limits relatively quickly. Uh, whereas a Dobs Dobsonian, um, you're talking about teles telescopes with uh, 12, 16, 20, 24 inch mirrors. And today's Dobsonians are. 16 and 20 inch mirrors, but they're very, very fast. So the big disadvantage in the past used to be uh, a 20, 24 inch mirror Dobsonian, uh, you might be on a ladder. Whereas now they're trying to make it so that if you're a little bit tall, uh, you might be able to uh, look through the eyepiece on one of these really large aperture telescopes uh, without a ladder or anything. So one less thing to bring with you, uh, at least when the telescope's pointed high up in the sky. Um, but uh, that said, um, I'm going to call out uh, one of the people in the uh, in the group, uh, Eric. I'll give you a little bit of warning. I'm going to call you out. Um, what is it that? Because I know we joke. Jo Eric and I joke about this. Uh, what's an eyepiece? Uh, uh, somebody in the comment section said, uh, well, I'd love to do some visual observing, but my camera's in the way of the eyepiece. Uh, so, so we have all sorts of ways of joking about it. But Eric, what drives you to prefer or to at least uh, have astrophotography be your passion? Well, I actually started out as a visual observer and doing it with a rickety old uh, refractor in my front yard seeing the moons of Jupiter, which was a, a cool thing to do. And not that I could actually keep it in the eyepiece. But a few years ago, I went back and I got myself a daub of 2011. And, and that was fun for a while, but difficult to move around. And my frustration was I could only see kind of fuzzy objects where we live, which was white polluted Chicago. Uh, then we went down, I got invited down to an observatory in Indiana. And you could see a lot more there, but still the objects were kind of fuzzy. Now, there are some things that uh, people might want to comment about, about how to get the best view, uh, looking through visual, which I never quite mastered, about star hopping, which, again, I never quite mastered. But eventually came to the decision that I didn't want to see little fuzz walls. I wanted to take pictures like the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, having, of course, we can never achieve that, but that's the point where I said, I've got to get a camera on the back of the telescope. And that was kind of the end of my visual observing about four years ago. Uh, those people that I saw do visual observing and could do star hopping, it was really kind of a cool thing. It just ultimately never appealed to me. I wanted to make those pictures. Is that, is that a, uh, that's kind of a quick summary, Adam. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, one, one thing I'll say, because uh, you, you mentioned star hopping, and it might be foreign to uh, some of us who've gotten into the hobby a little bit more recently, because go to, uh, I, I, when I first got into the hobby, uh, a lot of our club members kind of poo-pooed go to. 
uh, because you're not really learning the sky. Uh, I, from my perspective, uh, I'm learning the sky a lot faster because I don't have to sky hop, right? But no, they're, they're making a good point. I don't, I'm not learning where each object is in the sky. Um, and uh, the ability to star hop or the ability to use stars, uh, use a known star to kind of hop your way and move over, I think will help you um, identify the object or, or uh, be able to visual, uh, see the object um, a little bit better, or at least know when you're seeing the object. Because remember, it's not always that obvious. Uh, it might be the thing that drove me nuts about it is that I think I see it. I'm pretty sure I see it. Uh, sometimes it hits you, but on the more difficult objects, um, it might not. Um, I, there are some objects that your eyes just might not be good enough to see, uh, or your skies might not support the, the seeing of them, um, for whatever, for whatever reason. Uh, but, but, uh, David had made a comment before the show uh, about what he uses, uh, what he likes to do. Uh, I, I hope you know what I'm referring to. Uh, why he likes uh, first astrophotography and then possibly visual observing as a follow-up. David, go ahead. If, if if you know what I'm talking about, if not, I'll give you further clues. Yeah, it's it's not necessarily exactly that, Adam. But I, my point was that I have a better appreciation for objects when I see them visually after I've uh, photographed them. Because generally, I spend a lot of time on objects when I'm imaging it. I'm, you know, working the processing and everything. I, I want to understand the physics of what's happening with that object and everything like that. So I study it. Um, so when I go back and I see that object visually, um, I have a much better appreciation for it. I can see, you know, I can, well, at least I think I see more of the structure and things like that, you know, when I'm visually observing it. Um, you know, I do do a small amount of visual observing anyway, and I do a fair amount of outreach, which is, uh, you know, occasionally I'll do, you know, imaging, but mostly it's it's visual. Um, but, you know, I, I like the, you know, I, I get that better appreciation when I do visual observing on something that I've imaged. Um, it just, it, it helps me understand it better, and so I, I get a better appreciation of it. Awesome. Well, I and I and I know exactly what you're saying. I I completely agree. You know, you <clears throat> see, you, you look at the Whirlpool Galaxy, for example, uh, through the eyepiece for the first time, and you're you're going to be pretty impressed. But when you look at a picture of it and then look at it through the eyepiece again, whether or not you can actually see more, your your brain is going to convince you that you are seeing more, and I'm not sure if seeing the picture allows you to see more or your brain just fills in the unknowns, but for whatever reason, it's that much more dramatic. Our um, brains are very impressive systems for understanding visual information, and they're very susceptible to being you know, introduced information that isn't actually what you're seeing. So yes, I, I fully expect that part of what I see at least is not actually there, but hopefully some of it is, right? Adam? Uh, you know, I, I kind of probably came across as a visual curmudgeon, uh, but that's not really completely true because one thing I like to do visually is solar observing, either with a white light filter or with a hydrogen alpha. And I can sit out there and set up a telescope uh, all day long and go out there periodically and see what's moving around and see a sunspot and kind of zoom in on it. And kind of related to that, to put a, a video camera on the back and then look at virtually live pictures at the same time on the video camera. And I find that enormously satisfying, probably more so than processing the videos after that. Uh, so I guess that qualifies as video assisted uh, visual observing and visual observing. Mm -hmm. And actually that attracts, you know, kids from the neighborhood and even I get my wife out there to look through a telescope and say, that's a sunspot, see that? Yeah. So I'm not a total visual observing curmudgeon. <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, oh. it's a lot like what I said about planets. I, I actually just prefer planets to the eyepiece. And it's not that you can't take amazing images of planets, but uh, with planets, I've had 
people say to me, no, you're, you're joking. There's like uh, uh, a lens in there that's projecting this. That's not really Jupiter. And you say, no, that's really Jupiter. And they, no, it looks too 3D. You, say, you, you, you put a sticker up there, didn't you? You yeah, put a exactly, sticker up there. Exactly. It's exactly. amazing how many times I've heard that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Burton asked a question. I'll, I'll answer it in line here. So he asked me if I do EAA, electri electrically assisted astronomy, um, in my outreach. The answer to that is, you know, depending on how you define that, yes or no, um, generally when I have an imaging set up, it's a, my full imaging rig. So my full camera and telescope and, you know, laptop and everything, I take it all out there and set it up. Um, I generally only do that if it's a fairly large gathering and there's a whole bunch of other people with visual scopes on the field. Um, if it's only a few people, I won't do that, right, because it kind of takes away. But if there's going to be a large group, um, then I'll set up uh, an imaging scope so that you can have kind of a contrast and you can show people, you know, what the imaging is like just as well as you can, you know, the, the visual uh, part of it, right? So you, you get a nice contrast and frequently I'll target an object that other people are seeing visually uh, through other scopes around me so that they can see the scope, you know, the object visually and then they can come by and see what you can do with the camera with, you know, specialized equipment, right? Yeah, frequently it could depend, for outreach at least, it could depend on your audience. Um, I've done it for uh, where I knew the audience was going to be more children, uh, for, for our solar outreach, and uh, I brought my laptop and hooked my uh, camera up to it and put a little sun hood over my laptop so it gave them the feeling that they were actually looking into something to see the sun, but I knew that they were going to be able to make out the... Um, the prominence is a lot better, uh, or any sunspots in H alpha, of course, uh, better looking through a mono, uh, looking at the uh, laptop screen with a monochromatic camera as opposed to looking at uh, H alpha through the eyepiece. Which uh, for solar, it could go either way. Uh, sometimes people are blown away by by what they see. Some pe times people just see that red ball and they don't, they can't see the sun because the red ball is in the way. Uh, so. You know uh, our club does a lot of outreach, and uh, we've got about six or eight um, men and women who go out to malls and schools and things like that. And we always try to have some, uh, well, a mix of both. And we usually try to make them during the first quarter moon because that's when you get the best views of the moon and there's always something to see when you're in the light polluted city. We find that the great combination is to have one person scope on um, with uh, either the revolution imager or some other form of video astronomy looking at the moon. And that person can actually point to the screen and say, now look at this crater here. You see how the shadow is here and here? And if you come back in an hour, you'll see where the Terminator has actually moved and you can't see that shadow anymore. And, and look at the dimple in the middle of this crater, see how it kind of pops up back in the middle, like a drop of milk, uh, hitting a, a cup of milk. Um, and, and then we say, but you know, if you really want to see this well, go on over and look through that telescope right there, because the telescope is always so much brighter, sharper. Uh, it's just so much more impressive to look, to look at the moon. And I think that's what you were saying about your planetary stuff, that it, it's just better. The, the views are just better. I also think when you're talking about deep space objects, there are lots of kinds of deep space objects. Back uh, 200 years ago, they were all called nebula because they were nebulous objects, nebulous meaning cloudy. But now that we can distinguish a little bit between one type and another, um, I think uh, I, have, I have never seen a M13 that is as impressive as M13. Uh, and uh, there, uh, the Pleiades, when it's on and sparkling, I think looks as good or better, even though you can't really see the nebulosity in the Pleiades, and most of our photographs give you a lot of, of nebulosity. But an open star cluster and a globular cluster, I think, have better views. I agree that, the, that um, um, many of the... Um, uh, gaseous objects don't so much uh, have, have a better view. But I, I think uh, using a combination of uh, electronic assisted astronomy and visual astronomy at a public outreach 
can really show some people the differences. Oh, and by the way, we also sometimes turn our revolution imager on M42 and some of the other uh, bright nebulae. And like, you can't see them uh, from, you know, from a crowded mall. Yeah, you can you can look at them and say, see, see the fuzzy spot in the in the visual scope? And people will say, yeah, I see it, but why are you taking your time to show it to me? Because it's kind of ugly and not very big. Well, you show them that same thing with the uh, EAA, the Electronic Assisted Astronomy, and yeah, it does make a big difference. Uh, I'll add one other point to that, which uh, specifically for outreach. Um, it is nice having an EAA or an imaging set up uh, for people that have you know, need disabled access, because a lot of the times they can't always get to the eyepiece of some scopes. Um, it's not all scopes, but some of them can't. Um, so having the screen set up and someone that can talk to it um, can actually be very good for outreach events like that too. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I've actually had that happen where uh, um, I was doing solar outreach uh, for kids with muscular dystrophy. And unfortunately, one of the children wasn't able to actually make it to the scope due to the way his wheelchair was. Um, and I had burned up my, uh, what do they call it, sun funnel that morning. Uh, so my sun funnel was my backup plan and uh, I ended up uh, melting my eyepiece, which can happen, uh, go figure. Um, I, I have a funny story about, uh, you know, not knowing visual astronomy. Um, I, you know, I learned astronomy in New Jersey, which, you know, you're lucky if you get five stars visually. And um, uh, in December, I went to Deep Sky West in New Mexico, and I'm gonna do some sort of an alignment, and you know, you slew to a star, I'm like, which one is it? There are like billions of them. <laughs> And uh, I, I couldn't figure out which star was which. So, um, and that, that's the reason why I went to Astro Imaging in New Jersey, because there was nothing to see. But if, so now that I'm thinking about it, and if I had started in a dark sky place like New Mexico, I would have went maybe a different way. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, you are at the mercy of your skies and your sky, and your sky quality. The darker the skies are, uh, the, no matter basically what it is, uh, it's going to look better. I mean, yeah, the moon looks great, even if you're in uh, Manhattan uh, between, the, uh, between the skyscrapers. But um, for any sort of deep sky objects, the, the more contrast you get out of it, the darker the skies are, the more you're gonna be able to pick up on the little nuances of the object. And um, that's what's gonna make it more impressive. And I've had the same experience that Tolga had uh, just at our local club, which is um, half an hour from here. I live in a red, probably white zone. It is only, uh, I think it's, yellow so it's not an extremely dark sky zone uh but uh it is a lot darker than here and when you set up your uh your telescope on a moonless night uh if you're used to setting up your telescope in here and you just uh where's polaris well look north and it's basically one of the few uh, one of the few stars you could see no uh, there, look north, and you see thousands and thousands of stars, and you can't p pick out Polaris. Uh, I I've had to ask at our, our club observatory a few times. I'm like, it's 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 somewhere over here. Which one? Um, my my honestly, my trick to figuring out where Polaris is is setting up early uh, at sunset, and it's one of the few stars. If I wait too long and I try and set up at night, I I'm lost in the sky. Um, try try following the little dipper. Right, right. Uh, what is it? Uh, yeah. But it's still, I don't know, there's so many stars. I guess if you're used to it, if you're used to that many stars, it, it, it's easy. Uh, like Tolga said, uh, he, he can see five stars. I can see maybe 15 stars in the sky from the city here. Uh, at least obvious stars. Um, 
You know, I think one of the, one of the things that has to be mentioned is that is that um, there is a lot of geek appeal in astroimaging. Uh, somebody had a comment earlier up there about how telescopes are changing, and there's one really cool one with cool telescope. I don't think anybody ever describes Dobbs as cool telescopes. You know what I mean? Um, but the imaging telescopes you can start describing as cool because they got all these wires and the cords and stuff like that. So that has an attraction for the audience that we have here. And I, I think that that draws people to it. We that's and we're just, go ahead. Alex, that, that's particularly true of the younger generation and, and some of the grade school and high school outreaches that electronics is, is just their life and uh when they can see something that has substance to it related to electronics and electronic information it it clicks with them and we've also discussed uh probably all of us have some sort of tendency towards uh what alex calls gearheads but uh just gadgets and gizmos and uh uh technical uh challenges right the the technical challenge of actually being able to align your telescope on polaris then get your tracking working uh, excuse me then get your guiding working then get your uh get your whole setup working so that you can uh take those images it's not just taking of the image if it was just taking the images and processing them then uh everyone would do it some people would get sick of it but um I think basically you have to be able to, uh, you have to have that technical knowledge, you have to have the patience. And uh, if you stick with it and you don't sell your equipment to Alex after uh, a month and a half, then uh, you're, you're probably gonna be putting out some impressive images. Um, but you have to have a few of those uh, things. Uh, wanting to do it might not be enough. You have to uh, wanna do it and then you have to be willing to kind of put that effort in and learn. Um, oop, that comment just disappeared. Yeah, and some, and, and the other comment you're going to hear is a lot of us are in, light, just like Toga said, a lot of us are in light polluted skies. And uh, there are ways that you can image and overcome that light pollution. Um, there are uh, filters and techniques. Uh, there are filters for visual observing as well. Um, but, uh, you know, with astrophotography, we're really trying to show as much contrast and as much actual real detail as as is there. Um, and, and you're always going to be pulling that out. Uh, I, I when I first got into astro, or when I first got into astronomy, um, long story short, camping trip in West Virginia see a galaxy naked eye driving home can you actually see a galaxy naked eye yes you can i did wow that's amazing i need a telescope um so i, I started shopping for my telescope and i heard that disclaimer well remember it's not going to look through the eyepiece like it does on the box and uh th those images on the box they might be Hellis hubble telescope things or they might be amateur images and i, I said wait amateur images what do you mean by amateur images. Well, yeah, you can take your telescope out and hook a camera up to it and take images of this. So, so wait a minute. If I look through the eyepiece, it's kind of fuzzy, not in color, but I can hook a camera up to my telescope and take an image that looks like this. Yeah, I want to do that. I need to do that. Uh, and then boom. Sure, it's not quite that simple, but it, it got my brain working, it got my, my uh, uh, everything going and I, and I really wanted to find a way to accomplish that. And I did. Um, that's what drew me to both astronomy and astrophotography. I guess I should say that's what drew me to astrophotography. I think the same uh, interest draws us all to any form of astronomy. Uh, whether it's uh, cosmology and where do we, where did it all come from or uh, physics and and uh, how, how is it all working up there? Uh, but just that questioning of things that are far away and, and seemingly impossible to understand, yet 
we know so much about them. Uh, we know very little about them, but we know so much about them. It, it, it's just impressive. And, and the curious thing is the only way we know about them is through the light that they omit, they emit and how we interpret that light. That's the, that's the only way we can find out anything about all these things, except yep. for the moon, which we can go, but that's all in the story. Hey, there's been a few questions there. Somebody's asking if I use filters and I started answering and it was just too much typing because I've got three stories to tell. One is not generally, I don't generally use filters. Um, I can, I've got big enough scopes. So my, my travel scope is a 12 and a half inch top and my um, home scope out in my observatory is a 15 inch top. So both of those are quite quite good for, for using and you don't necessarily need filters for them. And I'm in a dark sky site when I'm using them. So um, when you're looking for a planetary, um, it's better if you have a filter, a uh, nebula filter of some kind, because they'll come out better and they'll, they'll be a different shape. Many times planetaries look like stars. You can't tell the difference between a planetary and looking like a star. But if you put a, um, a filter on it, you'll see that the planetary uh, gets larger relative to what it was before. And that's how you can tell. And I was down in New Zealand uh, the last couple of weeks, uh, trying to complete my Caldwell list, and I missed. I've still got 14, I think, to go. Um, the weather pooped on me, and dew pooped on me, and I just had a. But I had a great time down there, and the people at the Central Star Party were wonderful. They were very, very accommodating. But um, I had one object that I had to identify that was a planetary, and I think I got it. I, I you know, just by star pattern and where it should have been, I think I got it. But I really was lacking a planetary, a, a, a nebula filter to pick out the planetary. Secondly, I was out at our site um, a couple of weeks ago, or three weeks, I don't know when I was out there. And I noticed that I, I couldn't find any of my filters. My, I've got um, a case with all my eyepieces in it, and of course has my filters in it, and all my filters are gone. So if anybody has stolen Alex's filter, I will hunt you down because I don't know where all my filters are. All of them are gone. It's not like one are gone. There's a case missing or anything. They were all, you know, like I must have cleaned out my eyepiece rack and I forgot to put the filters back in, but I got to find them at some point or buy new ones, I guess. But yes, they have some good. They are even more valuable in town than they are out of town. And I get a lot out of the sky glow. There are hundreds of kinds of filters out there. And which one you like, uh, depends on the object, of course, um, when you're going visual, but it also depends on your own taste as to what you like. I know people that will sit there and argue better, you know, which one's better and which one's better. And when it gets down to those kinds of arguments, I'm not sure that there is one answer. So you, you're going to need a few, um, and different objects require different things. But a general good, my Teleview Nebustar filter was the one that I would go to when I really wanted to boost contrast and stuff like that. Alex, speaking of filters, there's a bunch of us here in Idaho that are looking for cloud filters. You got any? <laughs> um, no, I don't. There's okay. no such. Although sure. you know, the Latin word for for cloud is nebula. Thanks. <laughs> thought I cheer you up. You're just you're looking at a great big nebula up there, folks. Well, that's my, we had a, a club member who used to say, "If it's cloudy, just." Point the telescope at the clouds, tell them a nebula, they won't know anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Say, Adam. Yes. If you get <clears throat> very comfortable with all your electronics and uh, that kind of imaging, I got started with film astrophotography. Uh -huh. that, that is a challenge. Yeah. You know, I can't even comprehend film photography. Um, and I went to I went to Rochester Institute of Technology for uh, a couple of years and was in uh, all of my classmates were uh, basically photography majors and had to develop film uh, on a daily basis. And within like, I don't know, five years of graduating, basically, you cannot you can't even get the stuff to develop film. Right. Yep. Um, I have a I have a film developing sink at work that I can't sell because nobody develops film. <laughs> so 
or a trough or whatever they call it. I don't even know. It's like 12 feet long and you could probably develop tons of useless. Um, even uh, a club member's trying to give away his uh, hypering setup, right? Because uh, you would uh, treat the film with some sort of gas, I think it was, and it would make it more sensitive. Um, can't even give it away. But uh, but credit goes to anyone who was able to do it in uh, do astrophotography with film. Yeah, hyper oh hyper cooled the film to lower the ISO. Yeah. Yep, high school photo lab for film development. Um Adam, while you're looking while you're looking through there and getting your answers ready, uh a while back we had a couple of comments about um remember when I said that I skipped my imaging rig set up and uh then when it's running sufficiently, I go out and start doing uh, visual astronomy. And as it was pointed out, well, you know, how does your how do your eyeballs ever adjust? I, I've got to admit, they don't. You know, they they don't adjust well. I don't become a good visual observer. It'll take you know, it takes forty five minutes to adjust. Uh, there are things you can do. You should have a red screen, but you know. If you're imaging any place at a star party with other people around, you should have a deep red screen and a box over your over your machine and a whole lot of other things so that no light gets out. And watch out where that light is going afterwards. I've had people say, hey, look, I set up over here so that, you know, my light was coming back this way instead of out towards the observing field. So what do you want my case about? And I say, okay, stand up, turn around, and look at your rig. And... First off, they're casting a shadow on the back of their SUV because they've turned their, their monitor around so that it pointed at their SUV, which then reflected everything back out onto the field. So think it out, guys, you astro imagers. Um, and I mean, be, be careful with that kind of stuff, but no, you will never, you're, you're, if you're trying to do both visual and cameras on the same night, yeah, don't. Yeah, I mean, not if you're going after the really faint fuzzies. You're just not going to be a good uh, visual astronomer. Um, but you can get a lot of visual astronomy done. You can do a lot of star hopping. You can look for a lot of globs and a whole lot of things. And yeah, you, there are some other things you can do besides using the red screen and, and all that other stuff. Even a red screen, though, okay, you've got to have a dim screen. Because while red is better than white light or blue light, as comes off most of our monitors, it's not as good as no light. Uh, so remember that. But the other thing is an eye patch. One of your eyes is stronger than your other eye. For me, it's my left eye. It's the eye. If you're wondering which eye is better for you visually, it's the one that when you go to look through an eyepiece, your eye, that's the eye that tries to look through the eyepiece. And while the other eye says, yeah, you go, you go ahead and do it. You're better at it. And, um, and one of your eyes is more, one of your eyes is better than the other eye. Get an eye patch for that particular eye. And the real pros, the real, the guys who really do visual astronomy always have that eye patch on. And the blank eye, the one that's not covered is reading the eye charts with a dim reddish flashlight and uh they're doing all that other stuff checking their charts and doing their 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 sketching and stuff with that uncovered eye but then when they're ready they go over to the um, um telescope they do their star hopping and then to actually observe they flip the eye patch over to the other eye and use the eye that it's been protected all this time so that will help you out but hey uh you know, like the half track in World War II it had wheels in front and tracks in back so that it could go either through the, the swamplands or through the uh, or down the road. In fact, is it, it wasn't very good at doing either of those things. OK, but at least, you, you know, you're, you're making an effort. Thank you. Also, um, those little LED lights that we have on our little cameras and USB hubs. Yes. Um, those things, when you're dark adapted. They look like flashlights. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Forget about the laptop. 
take some black tape right? with you. We need, we need to make sure that we got to cover those, put a piece of tape on them, because they will destroy your night vision. Yeah. Yeah, you have to remember when you're going to truly dark skies, it's not just the skies that are dark. Everything's dark. And uh, one little light, uh, it uplights your telescope in red light, it, just because it's a red light. Uh, even the, the lights that, that are on our CCD cameras, right? Um, yeah. They get pretty darn bright. That, uh, that's what I'm talking about. You know, you know that little flashing yeah. download light that flashes in the back of your CCD? That's, yep. When you're on dark side, after 45 minutes, you look at that thing, it looks like a spotlight. I mean, it's super bright. And, you know, somebody who, you know, you know, first of all, you, you can make a lot of people upset. And plus, you're going to ruin your own night vision, too, if you're visually observing. So uh, just I just make sure that I put black tape on all of those little LEDs if I'm at a star party. Uh, this isn't really fair to David, who chimed in, headlamps for everyone, because I don't know what i mean you know when you're when you're typing something in you don't know exactly whether the guy's being facetious or what but i for instance hate headlamps they never go where they're supposed to go i mean they're fine if i'm all out by myself and i need to see something on my rig but they're generally way too bright and if you're talking to somebody and you're wearing a headlamp you're glaring a light in their eyes so uh, and i sorry david you're not signed in and you can't talk back He's but joking. you can type back if you want yes i am joking that's good because um and then anyone else seen someone with christmas lights yes and flashing lights i particularly hate flashing lights i'll tell you if you need to light where your tripod is if you need little lights there to tell you so you don't trip over them get yourself a different hobby you shouldn't be out at night. And, and honestly, waiting an hour, wait an hour in the dark outside, and you're going to see a lot more. It's all about dark ad adaptation. That's why you have the, uh, which we all have them, uh, the light Nazis at the star parties, right? Because uh, they want to stay dark adapted. And uh, you have to respect that, so you do as much as you possibly can. Some star parties will have the place for the imagers who are going to be using their laptops and they try and keep us far away from the visual observers um but uh kind of comes with the territory uh you you have to be as respectful as you possibly can but at the same time you kind of want to get your job done so get that red uh get some black tape put it over all the flashing little lights uh get the red the red stuff in the box for over your screen um uh uh glow in the dark tape uh it'll it'll work you can wrap it around your tripod feet and it'll uh just slightly glow so you'll be able to see it there and no matter what you do you're always gonna uh, uh trip over the power cord and knock the power off to your mount and have to uh realign or whatever it may be uh it's not just because it's so dark out there it's going to happen at some point no matter what um all right so i see we've gone uh, basically the full hour uh i kind of like this topic again as i said it was more of a beginner topic uh or or one of those topics one of those questions you don't know to ask as a beginner what is the difference between visual and astrophotography am, am i considering astrophotography well, if that question was asked of you and you were confused or at least had anything, maybe this show will help you. Um, I think we covered most of the questions and comments online. I don't know if anyone else in the room has anything quick to say, if there are any more uh, events or anything that we want to notify people of. Um, yeah, I want to know from David Frederick how he used to think that red light is no problem. I just think that sounds like a really good story. Don't ask me how. I used to think it is red light, no problem. Well, well how did David find out that it was a problem? Who informed him and how did he inform him? Because that could be a real interesting story. It could be boring too, but okay. <laughs> did you answer, did you see Morgan's question about she's not seeing the presentation on this channel only on YouTube? 
Yes, I went to the website and I was seeing it uh, on the website. So it was working for me. I don't know why. Morgan, if you pulled um, if you pulled the chat section out, okay. If you pull the chat section out, you you got to go back to where you got it from and and go up to the top of the page, and you should see a big window there. Now, would you say you're watching it on YouTube? Um, yeah, I mean that it, well, all all that the website does is show you the YouTube feed. You can also watch it on YouTube itself by going directly to YouTube. But but the way to the cool way to do it is to go to the Astro Imaging Channel. Uh, dot com right um, testing the astroimaging channel dot com which is what you must have done at some point to get into this chat that you were asking the question at um, and then there's a third way to do it but there's only about eight people that can do that at a time because of the limitations of Google Hangouts itself and that's how come some of us can actually talk on this and most of us are stuck over there um, um, on the on the uh, on the text uh, form. They are kind of get close to neat ticket sales, aren't they? What? It's It's got to be there. I'm sure they're going to change the website oh. very soon. I, it's about that time. On Neef on cloudy nights from the Oh, just about you're going to ask about Neef. We, yeah, we, we, we've had some shows about the about Neef. If you're going to ask about what there is to do on NEEP and stuff like that, um, rule number one is go to it. If you're, I mean, I go to it now and then, and I'm in California, and it is um, it is a really cool show. And NEAC, which is right before it, is also very good if you're into imaging. And you go over to Cloudy Nights, and you can you can find down in the down towards the bottom, you'll see um, oh, what's it called? Um, shows astronomy shows, I think it is, and you can see some stuff there. Yeah, they, um, for some reason, it takes a little longer for the NEAC tickets to come out, uh, the NEAC stuff, because of the reservations and the advanced planning. They always come out earlier. Um, basically, my rule of thumb is uh, I, I buy the ticket uh, the morning before I end up driving to NEAC and uh, unfortunately don't get the confirmation and have to talk to someone there, but they always let me in, and I don't have to wait on that line to buy tickets. Um, which is something to consider. It's nice not to wait on that line to buy tickets. Uh, but I definitely suggest NEEF. I mean, if you are within two, three, uh, 300 miles, um, it's probably worth the drive. I'm about, uh, about 120 miles away, and uh, I love it there. And I may, despite the fact that I'm probably still going to try and do it for the show, I may actually bring my kids this year. Uh, because after uh, a few years of them not having any kid activities, the last two years they have. So uh, I'm kind of excited about that. That said, uh, it's been an hour. Visual astronomy versus astrophotography. Thank you to all of the people in the room that uh, participated in the chat. Thank you to all the people uh, who are uh, uh, just watching. Uh, remember, you can always check us out every Sunday. You can see any of our videos on YouTube, or you can check out our videos on our website, um, basically whichever way you want to find them. Uh, you can search on YouTube uh, and basically just kind of see the, the list on our website. That said, thanks for watching. Uh, we will see you next Sunday. Good night, guys.